Good afternoon, Salam Alaikum. His Majesty uh, King Abdullah II, Queen Rania, our hosts this afternoon. We heard from President Azizi, President Abbas, and all the familiar faces in the front row and here at the World Economic Forum. It's a pleasure to be back in the Dead Sea. I'm John Defterius, Emerging Markets Editor of CNN and also the host of a program we're very proud of in its eighth year, CNN Marketplace Middle East, where we've had a chance to interview a number of you. Now, we had the chance uh, and the pleasure to hear the challenges of creating growth in this sort of environment today from His Majesty King Abdullah and also President Al-Zizi. Both countries, it's fair to say, are in a rebuilding mode uh, in a period of massive dislocation, which if I'm going to be candid with this audience this afternoon is far from being completed. Now that's the biggest challenge, how to create growth in this sort of climate. Uh, but as we found out from His Majesty, uh, that doesn't mean we stop the engine going forward. Uh, and what we're discussing here for the next hour is the Jordan relaunch. What does it relaunch mean? It means uh, an ambition to take growth of just over 1 per, uh, 3% in 2014 uh, to a baseline of nearly 5% and perhaps up to 7.5% uh, in a 10-year window. Most don't know that Jordan was growing 6 to 7% prior to the global dislocation of the banking crisis in 2008, 2009, followed by the Arab Spring. Now, it is ambitious. The goal is to create a, a bouquet of offerings for foreign direct investment of up to $20 billion. Some will be announced in the session lunch after this panel this morning, uh, creating fresh 180,000 jobs uh, to the additional target of 500,000 jobs in that 10-year window, and to create a sustainable environment for growth, regardless of what's happening around us today. Not an easy uh, task, of course, but certainly not something that the business community wants to throw the towel in on either. Uh, many of the business leaders in the Middle East have said time and time again during this period of dislocation, uh, there is opportunity, opportunity to invest, but also opportunity to create jobs for the future. We know this is a market potentially of 300 million consumers. It needs to create 50 million jobs over the next decade, and we can't stop progressing despite plans and ambitions of those who want to think differently. I'm going to introduce our panel after a, a short video here. Jordan relaunch video is a snapshot of those who have already invested in Jordan, who have already seen the potential of this market, is a member of the World Trade Organization and also has a free trade agreement with the United States that wants to go to the next stage. Please, let's roll the video and then I'll bring our panelists onto the stage. Thank you. We in Jordan recognize and respect the central role of the private sector and global partners. So your work is essential to create inclusive economic growth. If we look back 14 years ago where Jordan was and where it is today, we realize that a, an economy of 14 billion has become an economy of, of 40 billion. The country is on, on steroids. It does not stop trying to improve the environment for foreign direct investments. As we've thought about markets around the world where we want to be active, uh, we've looked for markets where the policy uh, at, a, at a governmental level was focused on, uh, on really making a fundamental change. Jordan is open, transparent, and attractive. Jordan is different. Jordan understands how do you create a win-win environment between the private sector, the public sector, and perhaps NGOs in the process. Maybe better than any other country in the world. It's a country where the leadership and the people want to leapfrog and go to the latest in technology and use that infrastructure to build the other industries. We in Jordan are offering over $20 billion worth of public-private partnership infrastructural investment opportunities. This project actually re uh, received a gold recognition as the best uh, emerging market infrastructure project in Europe, Central Asia, and the MENA region. The partnership between the Grand Tour, the Jordanian government, and AIG uh, works very, very well. We're in the business of developing and running infrastructure projects. And if you're looking at the infrastructure in Jordan, there is plenty of opportunities to enhance the infrastructure. 
Railroad is essential in the longer term in order to have an efficient infrastructure when we're talking transportation. Akaba can be a hub for the Rhineland Levant region. With the railroad combination airport, seaport, that would place Akaba as a unique hub, logistic hub in the Red Sea region. Uh, it has uh, nine uh, seaports, specialized seaports. It has uh, eight logistic centers and it has uh, an international airport, uh, as well as it's connected to the uh, regional countries with a strong network of uh, highways. As for the year 2020, we shall uh, be starting on uh, Marsa Zayed, and that's again a huge compound, more of a uh, multinational uh, city uh, in Jordan. <laughs> Jordan, we are on the tourism map, and the Dead Sea has become a destination. Uh, before we had two hotels only, now we have six or seven hotels. They are coming from Europe, from uh, East Europe, from uh, the United States. We have more than 50 percent of our guests are foreigners, even under the circumstances. One of our future major uh, infrastructure related to water and desalination, as well as uh, protecting the environment of the Dead Sea. So this project that we are going to implement with other regional parties will be a major infrastructure project that will supply Jordan uh, with the fresh water at least for the coming 25 years. Urban development is on the go. This is a growing city. We are going to offer close to 3 billion dinars opportunities of uh, investments. Look at the BRT which is a part of public transportation to carry people from point A to B. So Abdali is within that configuration that says it's a business center, it's a touristic center, it's a banking sector. Today that vision is a reality. This partnership has proven success not only in Abdali, there are other projects that Jordan has come up with that are also private-public partnership. Investing in Jordan has many values. We had a great experience doing business in Jordan and that is because in this country, government honored the commitment. There is a culture of fair transaction and most importantly, there is a growth opportunity in this country. It's very important as we move forward as economies and, and into a progressive future that we develop local sources of energy, uh, local ways of storing that energy, and then local ways of uh, using uh, that energy in electric vehicles and uh, solar and wind generation and battery storage offer that opportunity for us to uh, develop in Jordan, to develop in the U.S. and develop in, in other countries around the world. Our uh, wind project was the first of its kind to be uh, developed in Jordan. Uh, we are now well into our construction phase and hopefully within a few months we'll be um, into the operations phase of, of the project and Jordan will have uh, the first renewable energy wind farm in the region. We are experiencing IPP1 which is the solar, the largest solar farm in Amman with 170 megawatts concentrated in the Amman development uh, zone, the highest irradiation experience in the, in the southern part of Jordan. What is very exciting for me is Jordan has this opportunity to become the model country for what a 21st century electrical infrastructure should look like. When that's proven out in the region, that model can then be exported through Jordan to other countries in the region and make the entire region replicate a very successful model in Jordan. We've done a lot of work for others from Jordan and, and uh, what we want to do is to uh, start to create our own solutions, our own intellectual property that we can uh, export globally and, 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 and retain talent at parity with global standards. That's, that's the contribution that such an ecosystem, such founders and startups are really contributing to the Jordanian economy. The National Broadband Network is a strategic structural project for Jordan because it's the infrastructure which will facilitate digitalization of the services. So we'll witness Jordan connected, fully connected through this National Broadband Network, which will of course secure a very secured network 
affordable network and better services for Jordan. The world is our market, so we are exporting uh, technologies, uh, educational technologies to the world. Uh, we are in Jordan not because we are Jordanian only, because of the taxation law that allows us to export to the world out of Jordan and enjoy a taxation break that no other country in the world can offer. I think once again Jordan is ahead in relaunching their economy and understanding the importance that the ICT community will play, not just in the growth of the economy, but being so deeply embedded in every change that occurs. Our partnership with the Jordanian government as a success story is a sign to investors, go for it. We know where we're going. We determined resolve is our theme. Jordan is relaunched. So an eight-minute video that gives you a very comprehensive look of what uh, the projects have been underway for the last uh, 10 to 15 years, and despite the obstacles of the uh, global financial crisis and what we saw over the last few years here regionally, uh, the idea is now to take 3% growth up to 7 to 7.5% growth by 2025 at the latest. I'm going to introduce our panelists. Let's save the round of applause until they're all on stage, and then we'll have about uh, 40 minutes for discussion and hopefully a few questions from the floor as well. Let's uh, welcome His Excellency Mr. Mohammed Al Alabar of uh, Imar Properties and Eagle Hills, Dr. Bassam Awadullah, Chief Executive Officer of Tomo Advisory, Lieutenant General Stephen Butil, Vice President of Cisco Consulting Services, Sir Suma Chakrabati, President of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, Sheikh Bahadine Hariri, owner of Horizon Group, Lebanon and Saudi Arabia, Mr. Ling Ming, the Chief Executive Officer of Han Energy Global Solar Power Group of the Netherlands, and yours truly hosting this session. Nice round of applause for our panelists for joining us today here in the Dead Sea. So we had a fairly glossy look at what was taking place in the country here, because of those are all the constituents who have already invested or have worked to make this investment uh, come to life here in Jordan. We brought a variety of different stakeholders in the Jordanian economy as well, but I've asked all of them to take off the glossy glasses here, the rose-colored glasses, and look what needs to be done in this uncertain climate uh, to move forward. We have a slide of all the different sectors that were covered in that film. If we can bring that back up again, because this shows you uh, a sense of what's been done over the last 10 years, looking at the various investment opportunities here. So what, was, what we were talking about was from transport, ICT, infrastructure, water, tourism, urban development, and energy. This is an economy of just 10 million people. Uh, but can it serve as a catalyst for growth uh, in a neighborhood that is uh, very unsettled at this stage with Syria to the north and Iraq uh, to the east having problems even in the very last week. Uh, Mohammed Alabar, we've seen each other at uh, various panels uh, recently, uh, and you've talked to me in the past editorially about when there is dislocation, you have to look at whether there's light at the end of the tunnel, is the framework in place, are the politics right, whether you decide to put more chips on the table here. Now, during the eight-minute film, we saw the project in Aqaba. Uh, Masasai has got a huge development project. I was surprised when I covered it as a story uh, a year ago. You had a choice whether to, to come in or stay out. But the blueprint was there. You think it has a lot of potential. Tell us why you decided to come in and not fold at this stage. Uh, you know, John, uh, I think what's, what's interesting is that uh, as, as a public company, we've been in the business now for a good 20 years. I think the public see our number on a quarterly basis, so we can never hide. Uh, we've been living in a so-called unstable environment, I guess, at least I've been in, in the Middle East for 20 years after spending time in Singapore. So it has been one, thank God, decent story of growth. Um, so therefore, we are from the region, we understand the region well, and we understand the potential. And now, uh, as businessmen, the numbers have to work together. There ought to be a return at the bottom of it. 
while at the same time we are a bit emotional about the region because we are from the region and we are emotionally engaged and we want to do business but at the same time we want to be good to, to the society, we want to support our governments to really implement their economic policies and, and be good to society. But while we're, while we're emotionally involved, I don't think our shareholders or our bankers are going to be happy that we just get emotional. I think they want emotions, fine, but I think the numbers have to tally. So when you look at uh, Jordan and, and how we moved forward with our investment uh, in, if you talk about uh, Aqaba, uh, the numbers have to work and the numbers are working. And why the numbers are working, I think it's uh, probably uh, uh, macroeconomic issues, good or bad, they still reflect decently on the economy. I think there's good policies within the government, uh, uh, the leadership of His uh, Majesty, and, and, and we all understand that if it's really in, in my home or if it's in my company or in my country, if there is no leadership and there is no focus, plan, follow up, then you know, there is an issue. So there is a belief in the leadership. It has proven that, that it's working well and it works really hard, uh, Your Majesty, and we feel it. But at the same time, you know very well the region, you understand that the numbers are looking good, uh, but you know very well that the story moving forward is a story of growth. We've seen it, we're optimistic, and the same thing you can repeat, and you look at the, some of the stuff that we're doing, great stuff we're doing in Egypt, we feel the same way, there. we know the numbers, we know the growth story, even though you look at the whole region, you see, you know, we are the source of bad news to the world, unfortunately, but you know, we've got 300 million population, young, uh, government policies that are positive. I think governments are working hard to make it happen. And we at the private sector will contribute. But at the same time, the numbers have to make sense, otherwise our bankers and our shareholders are not going to be happy. So the story is a positive story for us. Okay, thank you but very much. But I must much. say one thing, John, is yep, that if you ahead. compare my rate of return on my projects, and if you take me to UK or you talk me, take me to the US, uh, you know, the numbers of rate of return in these countries is uh, relatively too, too small compared to the return I get in, in Jordan, if I were to look at Jordan or if I look at, at the region in general. Okay, thank you very much. And it, it, as uh, Mr. Alabar had mentioned here, he feels an emotional attachment to the region and making things work uh, for the better of the uh, broader market that I was talking about in my opening comments. Uh, one who can't take that view is uh, Suma Chakrabarti because he has to uh, report uh, to his shareholders as well, but he has to be present in so many different countries around the world. I was looking at the track record of the EBRD here uh, in Jordan and see that uh, through 2012, there's been nearly $440 million approved. And if I'm reading my numbers correctly, that could get up to $680 million of all the projects that are on the table uh, push ahead. The sectors that I brought up in terms of that chart before, uh, Sir Suma, uh, have a very diversified option here. What are the key sectors to build that infrastructure up correctly for other investors to come in for that second wave, would you suggest? Well, thank you very much, John. I mean, I think, uh, I, think uh, I would like to just say one thing at the beginning. It's okay to be emotional about this country. I'm emotional about this country. I'm a banker, I'm a development banker, but this country has a lot going for it and we need to support it. The key issue for me is how to close the gap between its potential and where we currently are in Jordan. Uh, and you mentioned the numbers. In terms of EBRD, in two years, we've had, a, from a standing start, a huge uh, start. Uh, and that has been due to some of the things my colleague has just said. We've had great cooperation, frankly, from the authorities, from the government, putting the right policies in place, trying to do the right thing, taking a long-term view. We, as businesses, like governments that take a long-term view and are consistent in their policies. The government has been. I think what the, His Majesty said this morning about the macroeconomic policy for the last few years has been an object lesson, in fact, to many other countries. Very, it makes it very attractive to many investors, too. Uh, there are things to work on. The investment climate clearly is something that does need to be worked on even further. Jordan needs to lift itself up the various league tables. But here are three sectors that I think really where Jordan, you wouldn't think at start from the start, has a great opportunity, but it has a massive opportunity. One is the energy sector. And you heard it from some of the people on the video. We're investing heavily in the energy sector, in energy efficiency, in renewables, in solar. In solar, Jordan has a comparative advantage compared with just about every country we're working in. And that's why we're investing very, very heavily in that sector. Another area would be the SME sector. I think the SME sector is uh, untapped uh, relatively. We're putting a lot of financing into the SME sector through banks and directly. I think one issue that we need to face up to in terms of solutions 
is perhaps the Jordanian banking sector is being a bit too conservative in my view. It's got a lot of liquidity, but I think the way it uh, approaches, um, if you like, uh, uh, loans is a bit too conservative. Asking for personal guarantees too often, I think asking also for collateral that is property, that makes it more difficult for female entrepreneurs, of course. Those are sort of issues that do need to be tackled, I think, to allow the banking sector, which has the cash, to put more money into the SMEs, and that would be good for job creation, obviously, as well. The third area, and again mentioned this morning by His Majesty and by others, is the technology sector. I mean, this country is now becoming a real power in the technology se sector, I think. And we're, again, putting financing in through uh, Badia, through a new national in innovation center, which we've just got money for, from the uh, Deauville Partnership Transition Fund. This is all very good, and this is in recognition that Jordan has the innovation, the creativity amongst its population to really take the sector further, to be a powerhouse, actually, in, in, the, in the region. Uh, one big issue, though, I think that we do need to face up to in this sector, and also in the SMEs probably as well, Jordan doesn't lack for creativity and technical skills. That's not the issue. What entrepreneurs, Jordanian entrepreneurs say to me, is they need much more support in for them to grow on business management skills. How do you run a company? How do you run it well? What sort of business plans do you create? What sort of corporate governance should you have? So that is, doesn't cost a lot of money, actually. It's good advisory services. And we in EBRD need to do, I think, more in that area, but also do others, too. Uh, Stephen Boutel uh, interviewed John Chambers at the last uh, World Economic Forum here in the Dead Sea, and it's rare that you see him so passionate about a market in the Middle East. You know, he can almost bleed Jor Jordanian uh, blood because he saw opportunity here in the past. And if you look at the list of what Cisco's done in the country, it, it's quite impressive. Healthcare and a whole different series of uh, diff different sectors. Where is it going next? Now, give us just a taster, for example, of what you've done in healthcare, what you've done in education, what you're doing in other broadband network services do you think are vital to the next stage of growth in the country? Thanks, John, and I, I think this is a, a great opportunity for a relaunch. And it, it's a relaunch in Jordan, but it's really a global relaunch because what's happened over the last 10 or 15 years, and Cisco's been involved since 1999 with the public-private partnership, a great relation with uh, His Majesty and the Kingdom. He identified very early that Jordan had, had not only the people but the capability to really, really stretch the envelope in the, in the region. And so we became very early in the public-private partnership. John absolutely believes in Jordan. You know that. He's very, very passionate. You saw him on the video. So in 1999, we became involved, and we started several different processes. And one of the things we do is we absolutely believe in the education piece, and that's through network academies that come in different forms. We have about 170 countries we have network academies in, either in a public-private partnership or in uh, our social responsibility. We started out uh, with, with the public-private partnership here, with the academies, and what we really stress is not only the technology, but the entrepreneurial piece, problem solving, communications, those things an employer works for. And we started off with, uh, initially, uh, with about uh, 340,000 people being trained in Middle East and North Africa, but the first one we did here was a UN Women uh, Gender Initiative Capacity Building. And we started off with about 8,000 people, of which 55% were women in the first initiation of it. We set up 15 Cisco academies. We, we next moved, and we have network academies in the military. We move about 400 people a year through that. We have uh, the Jordan Engineers Association. We have three centers with the Jordan Engineers. We produce about 500 certified people out of that a year. We have the Jordan University Initiative of Science and Technology, the JUST program. Uh, we're trans translating health information networking into Arabic through, for use throughout the Middle East. That'll be done in, 19, in 2015 and 16. We've been investing in companies. Uh, we invested in, we needed a technical support center in this part of the world, ATTAC as we call them. We invested in a small company called Astarta. That company now has 270 people. It is our TAC, our technical, technical advice center for the Middle East and now for a lot of the world. It gets some of the highest ratings of the world. Jordan's resources and treasure are the young people, and that is a tremendous resource. Uh, Jordan Healthcare Initiative, we've, we started that in 2014, or 2011, we've been doing that for four years. We have the Jordan Health Initiative, we have mobile health vans, we have radiology vans, I think we've had about 110,000 patients go through that, 
And we're also in the venture capital side, and we're part of the BIDA fund. We put six million of that, which is invested in eight different companies. We've committed to invest more. So we absolutely believe this is the right place to be. Okay, that uh, means that Cisco came in uh, when His Majesty came into uh, the reign here, 16 years on the ground. My question was a little bit differently than the, what's been done the 16 years. Uh, what are you willing to do next in this sort of climate, particularly as an American company? Many American companies get scared away, Stephen, as you know. I think that the first thing is, whether we like it or not, this, this national, this broadband is creating a global engine for growth. It brings a lot with it, broadband and cellular pen penetration, but the broadband we're seeing grow is the engine for growth. If you are not a participant, you will be left behind. And what we're seeing is countries that embrace it, and they also have to deal with the downside of broadband and cellular penetration. Countries that embrace it create innovation. We call it Internet of Everything or Internet of Things because every device is being connected to the Internet. And over the next few years, it's like 14 billion now. It'll be like 40 billion devices connected in the next five, six, seven years. That's where the innovation takes place. That's where the global economy is going, and that's how you drive it. So what we are looking at is in our smart and connected cities, economic centers that we're doing, the four of them in, in Saudi Arabia, in Qatar, some of the uh, cities, some of the work that we're starting to do in Egypt. It, it really is driven by what's happened in the last five to 10 years, and that's everything is connected. A country that is not connected, that doesn't provide the opportunity for their industry and the people to participate will be left behind, and that's what we're trying to leverage globally. Okay. Bassam Odell is a very familiar face here in Jordan, but also uh, in the region, worked in the Royal Court in terms of the early stages uh, of economic policy in uh, 1999 and, and beyond. Uh, this economy is growing 6 to 7 percent, and you kind of felt the momentum of Jordan. And, and I can even recall a number of people willing to put money into Syria because they saw the opportunity uh, of the market. Then we've had gigantic dislocation over the last uh, five years. Now. His Majesty has suggested we'd like to get to 7.5%. And during our interview yesterday, I said, is that bar a little bit too high? He says, let's not forget, we were growing 7% before the global financial crisis. Concretely, though, Bassam, what are the ingredients to sustain 6 to 7% growth in Jordan at this stage? Well, John, just to keep it in perspective, obviously, the political situation has cast its shadow. I mean, the revolts, the uh, continued instability, the deep change that has taken place in Syria and Iraq, these are historically the two major trading partners for Jordan, remember, um, as well as what's happening in Egypt, Libya, uh, Sudan, uh, uh, and, uh, Tunis, and also Yemen. Um, this, has, this is rendering the future of the region increasingly bleak, and um, together with the stalemate on the Palestinian-Israeli front as well. I mean, that has put enormous pressure on Jordan. I think the two major economic aspects, the, re the two major economic results that have come out of this regional uh, situation, one, was, one is the hosting of uh, 1.3 million refugees, Syrian refugees in Jordan. This is equivalent to 20% of Jordan's population. And out of uh, a funding a necessity of a funding appeal of $1.2 billion, only $195 million has been received. That's 16% of the total funding appeal. So you can imagine what the pressure is on the government. Second, the second uh, result is the massive increase in the subsidies for the electricity as a result of the shift from uh, the natural gas to heavy fuel oil. With uh, that alone, I mean, as a result of the halting of, of the Egyptian uh, natural gas supplies, that alone has accounted for half of the national debt since 2011. Mm. So today's debt is almost 90% of GDP. This was 60% of GDP back in 2008. So you have a very bleak regional picture. Despite all of this, the International Monetary Fund only a month ago, on the 24th of April, comes out with a statement after its rev sixth review of Jordan's three-year economic plan uh, program and states, and I quote what the IMF is saying, uh, that Jordan is still uh, uh, persevering within a very difficult regional environment, uh, that it continues to face uh, burdens, social and economic burdens, on its economy because of the uh, conflict in, uh, in the neighboring countries and because of the hosting of refugees. This has affected also the external and the fiscal balance. Nonetheless, the IMF report continues, Jordan is showing a growth. Growth is actually ex accelerating. Inflation is low. And the external and fiscal uh, balances are gradually strengthening. And the banking sector is actually sound. End of the quotation of the IMF. Now, coming mm. from the IMF, this is not bad. 
This is a very good report about what the government is doing and about where Jordan is faring. And really, it is no accident, this resilience and stability of this country. I think it speaks volumes about the leadership of this country. It speaks volumes about the people of this country. It speaks volumes about the economy of this country. Remember, this country has gone uh, through two and a half decades of reforms, particularly since 1999, and you mentioned the start of 1999. The reforms that have taken place in Jordan are very deep. And many of them maybe were not continued to their full extent. May many of them were not holistic, taken in their holistic approach. but. Even with that, they really provided a shield for the Jordanian economy when the times became rough, and we are all still living in, in these rough times. And, and you can see that this is the case uh, today, when, when Jordan has been sheltered and resilient, and everybody's speaking about the resilience of the Jordanian economy. The second factor is um, that Jordan's big asset is its young and educated people. And this is something that is really a big asset, which is not uh, which is not there in many, many countries around the world. We do have an advanced infrastructure, and we do have, obviously, a very strategic location. This has helped Jordan. Remember that also foreign investment is part of our economy. 90 percent, uh, the foreign stock of investment constitutes 90 percent of our GDP. Today, 50 percent of the companies listed on the advanced, uh, tr uh, financial market are actually owned by foreigners both at the individual level and at the institutional level. Mm. So this really has, shows you that there is a deep knowledge of foreign investment and how foreign investment can actually affect Jordan and, and promote growth and sustain growth in, in the medium and long terms. So just, I'm, I'm sorry I'm taking a lot of time, but maybe no. if you just give me an, an additional minute. You'll hear from me if I think it's going on too. <laughs> uh, the Jordan obviously is a member of the WTO. It has access to over one billion customers worldwide. And uh, at the end of the day, Jordan's uh, uh, dynamic sectors like the IT have proven that they really can create jobs for Jordanians. This is all on the positive side, and this explains the resilience of the economy. But having said all of this, we all know that foreign investors are still shy. Uh, the regional situation, the political situation in the region is really reducing the appetite for foreign investment in this country and in the region as a whole. And I think this is the question that needs to be raised. I think this is the question that is on the minds of everybody in this, in this, uh, in this hall, saying that there is a very difficult regional political situation. There is a resilient Jordanian economy. The Jordanian economy is making a turnaround finally. How do we sustain that? How do we accelerate that? How do we actually relaunch the economy of Jordan? I think this is where we really need to discuss. And, and part, of the, part of the discussion sh should really focus about countries that have looked at uh, unconventional, extraordinary measures in distress times. Remember, Saudi Arabia spent 20% of its GDP in 2009 as a fiscal stimulus. The United States spent 6% of its GDP in 2009 as a fiscal stimulus. China spent 5% of its, uh, of its, uh, uh, of its uh, spending uh, in order to expand its economy back in 2009. You have many other countries, actually, that have looked at the monetary stimulus. The, the Federal Reserve in the United States increased the balance sheet, its balance sheet by 20 percent since 2008. So really, we really need to think out of the box. I think in the case of Jordan, coming back to Jordan, what needs to be done? I think the government is doing a very good job at focusing at the macroeconomy, at focusing at macroeconomic stability, at focusing also at regulatory reforms and public services. A few days ago, as you said, they, they issued the 2025 vision. And I think they, they really are concentrated, uh, concentrating as well on investment in major sectors, in energy, in water, in infrastructure, urban development. This $20 billion package, I think, is a very important thing. Having said this, this is necessary. This is very important what the government is doing. But I think in and of itself, it's not enough to actually boost the growth and achieve what His Majesty wants in terms of 6% and 7%. Remember, we need to create 400,000 new jobs in the next seven years. And this requires at least 6% real growth in the economy. In the Gulf region today, we have 600,000 Jordanians. Now, the Gulf is not going to be able to take more Jordanians over the next few years. So we really need to concentrate on our economy here. So I think what we need to do is to, to emphasize, in addition to what the government is doing, we need to emphasize two other ingredients. One is uh, uh, the human resource development by looking not only at the numbers, by looking at the quality of education. We really need to support entrepreneurship and we need to support innovation in terms of our focus on human rights resource development. The other thing is SMEs, and that's the last thing I will say. SMEs, as you said, this is a core of the economy of Jordan. We have 100,000 SMEs in Jordan. They represent 97% of the companies, of the total companies registered in Jordan. They provide 
60% of the jobs for the total workforce, and 70% of all new entrants in the market. SMEs account for 45% of our exports in Jordan. So this is really what we really need to concentrate on, funding for SMEs. You have to look at private equity funding for SMEs, which really is significantly low at, at, the, levels, at the current levels that we are talking about. If you give me a, a chance later on, I would like to just come up with another just proposal about public-private per partnership, if I have the time. Good, and I'd like to uh, also bring in Sir Suma afterwards about youth unemployment. Uh, we've talked about it for 10 years, and you couldn't suggest that this economy is not reforming, and there's a lot of examples in the region who are pushing the traditional economic reforms, but, but the birth rate is growing faster than the job creation, and this is uh, which creates problems. Opportunities, of course, because it's a young workforce, but also the challenges of finding them the right jobs and getting the right education mix, as you were suggesting. Uh, Bahadine al Harir, it's nice to have you on, on the panel. Uh, for those, before they leave Jordan, I would suggest, and I did this in shooting a story uh, last year, take like a seven minute detour and find your way into the boulevard, uh, into Abdali. It's really something I had talked about for the last four or five years. I've got to do it, I've got to do it. And actually, we shot a story last year. It's the new downtown of Amman. And I really thought it was all kind of glossy commercials and nothing there, and there's no destination. But Abdelli's going to the next stage right now with the John Hopkins University. Rotana Hotels has moved in there. It's a whole set of retailers, and it's become like the new Agora, if you will, uh, of Jordan. Now, the reason I bring it up, and I think it's an amazing project in itself, but it was delayed. I know you got hit by the global financial crisis. You had to have deep pockets to stay in. Then the Arab Spring, and people got nervous, and now it's gotten rebooted, right? At this stage today, do you feel comfortable that it can move ahead without any more setbacks after getting clobbered twice in a five-year window? Yes, I truly believe, I truly believe that the planning uh, and the leadership and the vision is there. You are right about the setbacks we had. They are big setbacks. Uh, Bernanke, the Federal Reserve Chairman, said uh, in 2008, we were not close to a recession, but a depression, a 1929 type of depression. So, of course, the ramification and the wave of this crisis even reached our region. Uh, today, yes, true, there are issues in Iraq and Syria and everything. Uh, but like uh, Mr. Al-Abbar said it rightfully, we are used to these issues in, our, in this region. Uh, Saudi Arabia is growing, Emirates is growing, Qatar is growing, Jordan is growing. We have to build ourselves and move forward. Abdali is only part of that configuration and that diversity in, its, in this economy. There will always be difficulties. But I believe, like Abdali to date, we are uh, going to open uh, a rotana uh, by the end of the year, uh, a mall by the end of the year, uh, Hopkins in 2017. Uh, banks are moving in uh, from the region and Jordanian banks are moving in. Uh, insurance companies are moving in. Why? Because they believe that the vision is there. And such project cannot succeed unless there is long-term vision. This is where such project can succeed. And I'm very happy to see the, the launching of the 20 billion projects, because this is what the government has to do, is provide the infrastructure and the, uh, like we have seen before, and the fac to facilitate private-public partnership. Because at the end, Abdali is a private-public partnership, and this is how we have to move forward. Uh, 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 the private sector is key to promote this growth in Jordan. This infrastructure that will see the light of day, hopefully, and that we saw in the last 10 years, this is what will bring more and more investments into the region. Not only in the 20 billion, but also promotion into the health sector, into the tourism, into tourism and other uh, sectors that has been developed uh, within Jordan. Good. Do you actually think, and if I can get a quick answer on this, that uh, Jordan can serve as a kind of a model like UAE does with Dubai as a financial center for this part of the Middle East. We saw a lot of capital coming in with Iraqi capital, with Syrian capital the last few years. But I know the banks are moving in. Do they see this as a second financial center for the broader Middle East and North Africa? I think the key for Jordan, Jordan's first has 
a huge history with Iraq. Jordan has a huge Iraqi diaspora, which is over a million, and that is living in Jordan. Uh, uh, I believe we have to build and to be ready for post-Iraq, post-Syria. The safety is here, the stability is here, the vision of His Majesty is here, and this is where we have to build and grow as it is growing. And I believe the 6%, 7% growth will be once Syria is stabilized, Iraq is stabilized. Maybe it's not for tomorrow. Maybe it's not for a year. But sooner or later, hopefully, this must see the light of day. And uh, I myself, I am more of a realist optimist, but a realist at the end. So you have to build and move forward. But I believe Jordan can play a big role into this configuration between Iraq and Syria. Good. Thank you very much for that. I'm going to come. We've got about 10 minutes. This is just right. But I want to go to Li Ming, and then I want to bring up some more provocative political questions in the context, because I often hear this discussion. Jeez, poor Jordan. King Abdullah is doing all the right reforms. If you only got a break from Syria, if you only got a break from Iraq, if only they would commit money as they pledged to get him through the crisis because of all the refugees. If only this, if only that. But I'd love to hear from the business community, where do we go here in terms of security? What would the business community like to see done in response to what we see in the region? So think about it, and I'll come back to you. Li Ming, I think it's an excellent time to bring up uh, the sector of renewable energy, taking advantage of solar power that Jordan has in the 300 days of sunshine. Uh, you're thinking of Jordan not just as a market on its own, obviously. You see it as a, with its free trade agreements, as an ability to build a base, a manufacturing base, and use it as a leapfrog to the broader region. Can you mention the strategy and also mention what perhaps you're going to sign here in the next 45 minutes or so? Tell me. Thank you, Joe. Uh, it's an honor to talk here. Uh, we come here well prepared uh, to invest in Jordan. We see today, we uh, listen uh, personally to his Majesty's speech and the Jordan's vision. So this is the most attractive thing to, to us, energy as a renewable uh, energy investment and manufacturing company. We always look at the leadership, the public, public uh, private partnership. The key is the public. Uh, without government vision, and, uh, and a strong leadership, you cannot uh, go on for, for long term and a, in a sustainable way. So we think Jordan at this moment is in uh, three elements are there. The, the timing, the location, and the people. And the timing is we are in a, a time that the change of our vision, how we are going to move forward on energy. Mm. And such a uh, change of the price of the oil, and the people are searching how we are going to move from now. So I think it's not the uh, disadvantage that under the ground we don't have much oil. It's OK. This is an opportunity. We search for alternative that's renewable. We understand that 20% uh, GDP is spent on import of oil. Can we make this 10% of this 20% made in Jordan? We make energy here without import. I think energy and other renewable companies, solar companies, will be able to help to bring the new energy to new economy and also growth of the economy to this uh, country. And we believe the time of uh, Simfilm power and the distributed um, power production and the mobile energy is the new era for, for this region. And uh, I think Jordan is in the center and can take uh, a leadership in, in, a, in a role that uh, to demonstrate how we can reshape our economy, reshape our energy uh, mi mixture.
Thank you. Thank you. On the, in, in terms of the Jordan relaunch, it's quite ambitious, the, the target here. The, the domestic production of energy now to meet the needs is just 2%. Uh, under this 2020 to 2025 plan, by 2025, they want to get that to 39, nearly 40%, which is a huge leap over a 10-year window. But you're pretty convinced they can do that. Yes. And our vision, Hanergy's vision, is uh, by 2035, it most likely will happen that uh, more than 50% of the world energy supply will not come from fossil, will come from other renewable and alternative energies. So it's good at a start from, for Jordan to straight uh, to invest instead of uh, the um, other energies, but renewable energy is the future, and particularly when the technology allows the efficiency converting the sunlight into energy, we can already reach 30% of such efficiency while you're using fossil, is only about 1% of sunlight come to the Earth. So this is a big uh, difference, and this era is already coming. Okay, thank, thank you very you. much. Now, I said I wanted to see where politics, uh, security, and economics converge. I don't think you can divorce the two. And we often don't talk to the business community, which is trying to looking for opportunities, looking to see where they can develop, uh, but have to navigate through a, a great deal of uncertainty. So I'm going to pepper the questions across the panel here for the next 10 minutes and be very blunt about it. Uh, do you think the global community, do you think the regional community, Mr. Alabar, the GCC, which has a very close affinity uh, with the leadership here in Jordan, is doing what it can to circumvent what we see around us in terms of chaos today. You're a leading businessman. You're in a number of different markets. What would you like to see done? Well, I might not answer you directly, but I, I definitely would like to see more done, without a doubt, because I think the, the interlink of relationship and security and economic well-being is one and the same, so I am 100% for it. But, but as a businessman, I also would like to tell you one thing, is that if Jordan is grown at about 4% now, and we're talking about all the chaos that's going on around us, this cannot continue. I'm optimistic that we are going to settle this. So imagine what will happen once the, all these issues are settled in the region in general. So therefore, I think we are going, I think we are starting at the right base now. Even if you ask me as a businessman, I think it's the right time now to make that investment if you are realistic, optimistic, and can assist risk. But also on another, we talked about emotion earlier. You know, why I'm emotional about some, or most of our investment, and, and the numbers have to make sense. As I said, the bankers will not help me. But you know, we as businessmen, I must tell you that, we get created because of government help. How did, the, how did I get created? I got created by my government support. I got created also in Egypt, by, by in, 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 in Jordan, by the support I get from the government of Jordan, and, and extraordinary support. So I think we as, as loyal human beings, I think also we need to be reasonable, even though we're getting rate of return, I think we, time to pay back as well. I think people are built on loyalty. I'm, I'm loyal to the people who came and picked me up when I was nobody and I became somebody. I don't think we should forget the favor, right? I'm, I'm, speaking, I'm speaking from my heart and, and I run a public company and I'm watched every three months. People want to know my profit. That's how much pressure I'm under. But I think at the same time, we should be brave to say, I've been supported. These people helped me grow. It's time for me to go in, and the numbers also making sense. So that's why I still believe, I think, emotions are important, because most of our businessmen in the region, we all got created by that extraordinary support that our governments have given to us. OK, let me follow up very quickly, though. Do you think uh, we're seeing the unity that we should in terms of a security basis? Are we going to get to the end of this in the next four or five years, or are we going to be having this conversation in four or five years I, about even greater dislocation? I, I'm very optimistic that I don't think we'll have this conversation. Really? Yes. Why do you say that? Well, I think I'm involved in, in so many issues. I deal with, with, with a lot of matters, and I see the unity. I see the work that's going on. I see the belief more than any other time that we are really one that we all need to support each other because we are all in this together. We are 300 million people or uh, more or less. And truly the events the past, I say, 24 months or, or 40 months have shown that we, we are interlinked. And I think the leadership also realizes that. Hmm. 
and they're working on it, and one month they do much better than other months, but they're focused on it. While they're doing that, I think also our governments are getting better. I think our governments are working harder. I think our people in the governments are re-engineering themselves. They are under pressure from the social media, so they are trying hard. Uh, so therefore, I think in the business community also we should work hard. Excellent. Sir, Sir Suma, you had a comment on this? I very, no, I very much agree with that. I think I'd like to make two points, though. One is you don't get to choose your neighborhood. And unfortunately, Jordan is in a very tough neighborhood. There's no doubt about that. So the key thing for us, people like me, but also for Jordanian government and private sector and other private sector investors, is to show differentiation, to prove to, new, to people who don't know the region well that Jordan isn't defined by the regional conflict. Actually, Jordan is very different. It's a much more stable, uh, good place to do business. And the foreign investment numbers show that, that people do understand that when you explain it to them. That's the first thing. And that's why last week in Tbilisi, Georgia, at our annual meeting, we had a fantastic session on Jordan and why people should invest in this country and convincing new people who don't know the region why it's different. The second thing is I think also as uh, people in business, people in development, we need to also help with this situation in Jordan. You know, it, it is a tough thing. 20% of the Jordanian population now refugees from Syria. This is huge in terms of economic and social uh, cohesion uh, issues. And so we, I think, uh, at the EBRD, we need to think about whether we can help through our private sector-based model in trying to help integrate the refugees into the economy to give them actually some options here as well. Hopefully one day for when Syria is again uh, a place where people can go back to and work, but if not, while they're here, to make a real contribution to the Jordanian economy as well. So there's, I think, two things we should be doing as business and development people. Okay. Basim Awadella, uh, to share some of our past together. In 2007, I think it was, we had a dinner in Dubai, and you were incredibly pessimistic uh, about the region at the time. You thought there was going to be trouble on the horizon, and lo and behold, it unfolded before our eyes three, three and a half years later. Uh, what's your view today in terms of the amount of dislocation we're seeing, and do we have to go down deeper to have further dislocation before we find a bottom? And what happens to the youth unemployment in this sort of environment, which festers into more unhappiness, you know, more dislocation, more radicalism? Where do we go? Well, in 2007, as now, I think the issue is about youth, it's about unemployment, it's about economics. Yes, the politics in the region have been very complex for many, many years, since at least 1948. That has not stopped Jordan from growing or other countries from growing. But I think it's economics. I think it's economics at the end of the day. And I think that we really need to assume the responsibility, all of us, whether in governments or private sector or, or NGOs or civil society. I think these are not ordinary times. These are extraordinary times. And they require extraordinary solutions. Whether we speak about Egypt or we speak about Jordan, you know, we have come out of financial distress, let's face it. Like other countries have come out of financial distress because of the economic crisis, we have come out of financial distress because of political reasons, because of the reg regional externalities. And I think we need to really think very creatively. I think what needs to be done, and I cannot see any other way except for a new public-private cross-border a partnership to be built. And I mean by that, you need to have foreign governments included, you need to have the international financial institutions included, you need to have the international institutional uh, investors, both international and local, involved, and you have to have the private sector, international and private involved. I think there are four stakeholders in this, and they need to come together in order to make sure that they identify what are the projects that can be really done, to look at the projects, to look at the sectors, what will make a difference to people. This, of course, needs to be taken in, in, in in, to look at the strategic, uh, uh, strategic uh, uh, sectors, at energy, at water, at urban development, but they also need to look at high-impact investments, investments which are going to make a difference now, not four years from now. I don't think anybody, the Jordanian people or the, or the uh, Egyptian people or anybody in this region are going to be happy if you actually achieve results for them four years from now. They want results now. I mean, I know His Majesty wants results tomorrow, but I mean, the people also, they want results in, in the next year. And you really need to actually achieve that. 
You have to do that. You have to identify what are the new industries, biotech, pharmaceuticals. How do you harness all this youth? How do you actually create out of the SMEs a real core for the economy? It will not happen just by grants from GCC countries. It will not happen just by government policies. All the government policies are needed. But the government is, is good at identifying projects. The private sector needs to come. The international financial institutions need to come. And foreign governments need to look at how this public-private partnership, the new paradigm model for development for the Middle East, needs to be sustained. That is the only way, in my view, that we can accelerate, we can sustain, and we can relaunch the economy in Jordan and elsewhere. Stephen, thanks. Hey, John, I don't, I don't think we can write the chapter yet in these next five to ten years. I'm not quite as optimistic. We have the huge growth of young people. We know that. We have the second largest bubble in the world except for sub-Saharan Africa. You know, we have a, a dwindling population in Eastern Europe, a dwindling population in Asia, and that group is not yet formed. If we don't provide the opportunity for that group to get educated and have something to look forward to, we have a problem. I'm confident in Jordan. You know, King Abdullah and the Queen have set out great vision. They got a vision, a plan 2025. If we can execute that with metrics and deliver for that young group of people, that huge population, we're on the right track. But we've got to do that across the region. And that can be a very, very valuable group of young people or a very dangerous group of young people. That chapter is not yet written in this part of the world. Thanks for the interjection. Uh, I think it would be interesting to hear from uh, Bahadina Hariri about where you're allocating fresh capital uh, in this chaos. So you're, you're not stopping, I would imagine. Where are you no. putting new capital? Uh, yeah, we're going into phase two. Uh, you see, we cannot force people into investing. And we see uh, the likes of 100, 200, 300, 400 million dollar projects. So uh, if, if that value proposition is not here, Jordan, without the chaos that is surrounding it. I think what has been built in Jordan in the last 15 years, uh, we, are, we have passed that critical phase where Jordan as itself, its value proposition and diversity can sustain a, a solid growth. Uh, uh, the vision has made us reach that uh, 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 past that critical phase. And this is how we see now more and more investments in all the fields with all the gentlemen talked about, including our field. So Anna, I think uh, uh, that will accelerate if we see uh, uh, stability in Iraq and, and, uh, and Syria. But I believe that the Jordanian model is solid enough today uh, that will attract uh, investment in all its sectors. So I, I don't see any, uh, actually I see from my side of the equation uh, more interest in, uh, 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 in our project. Yeah. Good. Quick follow-up for you and then I'm going to conclude the panel. Uh, the Gulf states have been very generous throughout the region. We've seen their work in Egypt, seen their work here in Jordan, mm. uh, different pledges during the most critical times. Mm. Uh, you were alluding to the DeVille partnership and uh, a potential Marshall Fund, uh, Bassam, and that has not come to fruition despite a number of different pledges. The EBRD has put money onto the table, but the $18, $20 billion that was floated a few years ago did not come forward. Do we have to get ready to a new reality? It's not 100 and above oil. It's not $100 to $115, $120 oil that we had over the last four or five years, but probably 60 to $70 oil where the Gulf states can't be as generous. What happens? Are we going to go through a really uh, big shock of dislocation in the Gulf where they trim back budgets? And these states, without the big partnerships that we talked about, that the proposal you put on the table, don't happen at all. We could be in for a second round of shock. Uh, Bob, do you want to take it first? I think that uh, the, the Gulf in general have done very smartly in the last 10 years. The accumulated debt that we have seen before uh, is gone. We have sovereign funds that generate quite a strong amount of cash flow. And uh, the infrastructure has been built. The private sector is very powerful. I mean, we've seen we've see the reminiscence of this private sector and investment in, in Jordan. So I believe the staying power of the GCC is there. Uh, maybe they see the growth here in Jordan uh, stronger, they will be, but I don't think this flow will stop. 
flow of investment. Maybe it will, it will be reduced from the public sector, increased from the private sector. Why? And if we're talking about Jordan, right? Because the, uh, uh, the, the oil, uh, the, the Arab investor wants a return. The return he has seen in my sector is strong in, in Kuwait and everything. Uh, and, and Saudi Arabia and, and the Emirates. But today, with the stagnation of this oil price, you are talking about 60 to 70, the return is not as much as before. They have made uh, a lot of return in the Levant, in Lebanon, in Jordan, uh, in the 60s. Now they're looking back again in, into this, these sectors again, because they realize with, uh, with these low oil prices, uh, the return is here in, uh, in Jordan. And like Mr. Abar said, it's the return that matters here. So uh, uh, the solidity of this return and the continuity of this return will make more the private sector looking at investing here. Okay, very good. Uh, final comments from Basab and then we'll wrap up the panel. Very quickly, if you can, please. Two, two points. I think the European example here is very telling. When the European Union started, it actually started in 1958 with the Treaty of Rome, and then you had an expansion. And the rich countries actually invested in the poorer countries and helped their economies to actually graduate and to grow and to spur growth in all of these economies. And then they opened up their borders for trade and for the flow of capital and for the flow of people. I think here we really need to look at collective security measures. I really think that when we look at the Arab countries, oil producing and non-oil producing, rich ones and poorer ones, I think there is a collective security for the Arab countries as a whole. And I think that when we speak about grants, it is not essentially just out of political favor. I think it's a collective security measure for all the Arab countries. I wonder sometimes that had, we, had the Arab world gone through all the measures and all the, had it implemented all the actual resolutions of the Arab summit when Amr Musa was there and speaking about Arab unity and collective Arab markets and the Arab free area agreements, I'm not sure we would have seen the Arab Spring in Tunis or anywhere else. I think that the reality of the Arab world would have been much, much more different today. I'm not sure Yemen would be today what it is had there been a serious investment in the economy of Yemen and for many, many years to come. So I think that when we speak about the, the, the collective Arab security, we really need to look at the economic component of it. But the, uh, the, the second point I want to mention is that today we really have to think not only about governments and about grants. Because I remember in the, in the economic summit that uh, President Sisi had in Sharm el-Sheikh, he came out and said, you know, if you think that four or five billion dollars is going to help Egypt, you're wrong, because Egypt needs 200 to 300 billion dollars. And that's the reality. Jordan needs more than 20 billion dollars. Jordan is indebted today with more than 30 billion US dollars. So you really need to have an, effectively, an effective Marshall Plan to graduate these countries out of what they are today into what you really want them to be. The private sector has an immense role. I think that we cannot really here just let the private sector away with getting away with this because it's, they have a serious role. I think people like Baha and people like Mohammed Abbar and many others and Cisco and John Chambers have shown tremendous uh, commitment to Jordan and a tremendous faith in Jordan's leadership and Jordan's people and, and Jordan, Jordan's economy. But I think we need to see more than that. We need to look into a different paradigm altogether right now. There needs to be a new partnership that exists between the regional and the global global private sector and governments. Governments have to be uh, not, uh, 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 not short-sighted, they have to be really far-sighted in how they address the private sector, but also the countries, the foreign governments, the international financial institutions need to move beyond the conventional wisdom of the IMF and the World Bank and look at us in a different way. It's high time for that. Okay, so Suma, it's your opportunity. You wanted to speak, and then Mr. Well, Alibar. I think Bassam uh, summed up a lot, of, a lot of it up. I think two points. One is the GCC generosity is fantastic. And I think it's very, very important. And from what I can see, despite the oil price uh, going in one way, I think uh, the GCC countries are still very committed to the region. But Bassam is absolutely right. But if we rely, frankly, on government donations, government aid, then this will not do the trick. Uh, we have got to move to a much more private sector financed mode of development. Uh, the, this country is trying to get its private sector going. I think that's much better supported by the private sector sources of finance. What I would like to see longer term for Jordan and all the other EBID countries of operation is much more equity participation from the sovereign wealth funds because countries like Jordan are starved of long-term capital. Hmm. And so one thing we, we in EBID want to do over the next year or so is develop an equity participation fund for all our countries of operation, but particularly a place like Jordan, where we are going to take more equity stakes in companies here over the next five, ten years. I'd love to see sovereign wealth funds come in with us 
to do that. Hmm. That's an interesting, innovative idea. Final thoughts here. No, I, I don't have. I, mean, I think they. I think both have, have done a wonderful job. I think that's, that's exactly the way to go, and that's and that will give me optimism that I think we're going to see more and more participation. I think it's going to move. There'll be a little bit of the donation side of it, but I think just the potential of investment and and large. Uh, funds being invested in these economies in whatever sector you want, I think it will add to growth and the, the well-being of the economy while, of course, you're getting few dollars, few ret return on your, on your capital and I think everybody wins and then you take care of security and employment, collaboration, integration of economies. I, I'm in full agreement. Okay. Nice round of applause for the panel and I have one final housekeeping tip here. Thanks very much. We are on time for 1.20. We have like a t window for a 10-minute break, and then there is a lunch uh, hosted by His Majesty and the Prime Minister uh, to uh, announce some of the packages of the Jordan relaunch, uh, and there will be a buffet on the terrace. You go straight out, and then down you'll see the signs. Thanks again for your attention, and thanks for your patience here in the audience.